We worship and glorify you. We exalt you, King of all the ages, God of all majesty, God of all power. Be glorified and exalted. We thank you, wonderful Savior. We thank you, glorious God. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you because of this wonderful opportunity that you've given to us. We thank you, blessed Jesus, because your word says that you daily load us with benefits. And we thank you because you have benefits, our Father, that you have come to load us with today. And I pray, Father, that you may clothe us with the anointing and the power of God. And dear Father, that everybody listening will receive the grace of God more than ever before. I pray, release your wisdom. Release your power and grant that everybody will be touched by the power of God like never before. We exalt you. We glorify you. Take your place in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Dear viewer, God bless you. Thank you so much for allowing yourself to come here today and be part of us today. Welcome to the River of Life Fellowship Altar in Don Home, Nairobi, Kenya. For those that are watching us from elsewhere all over the world, we pray that God is going to speak to us even as we delve deeper into prayer. One of the reasons why I've shared with you about prayer for a long time is basically because I know that God uses prayer to build capacity in the life of the saints. There is nobody in the kingdom of God that has ever become great without prayer. There's nobody in the kingdom of God that has ever gone far without prayer in the domain of the kingdom of god prayer is key it's a lifeline that's why even our lord jesus christ was a man of prayer the bible talks about how early in the wee hours of the morning jesus would go to the mountainside to pray the bible talks about how when he came to the place where he wanted to make a tangible serious destiny consequential decision of getting to select the apostles out of the disciples that he prayed the whole night Bible talks about how he prayed throughout the entire night he had an all-night of prayer all by himself because of that decision he could not just pick the disciples and just pick anybody he needed to first of all wrestle in prayer until he had a breakthrough and he knew who was going to be who even in that team and that is who we are we are called to prayer and so if i can be able to build prayer in your life i know i can be able to build a new capacity that will help you be able to thrive in this life and that's why i'm still talking to you about prayer we've been talking about what i call the four dynamics of prayer and we're in the the third one we talked about the fact the fact that the first dynamic of prayer is what we call devotion 
And number two, we talked about the fact that the second dynamic of prayer is supplication. And now we are talking about warfare. And I'm in the place where I want to share with you the last principle of warfare. We've been talking about the principles of warfare prayer. And I want to share with you today the last principle of, of warfare prayer. We talked about the fact that the first principle is that warfare must be founded upon devotion. Don't lose that. If you do not have a sound devotional life, you will have a sick warfare life. It doesn't matter who you are. Number two, we talked about the fact that there must be a cause. There must be a vision. There must be a reason for the fight. And number three, we talked about the fact that you must build the capacity to win the battle. And number four, you must know when to fight. And number five, you must arm yourself for battle. And number six, which is what I'm winding up on, is the fact that if you're truly going to have successful warfare, you must fight to win. You must have this resolve in you. That even if you went into a battle and you are broke down, you are wrestled down, you are going to organize yourself, come back again and fight. You cannot afford to remain in the place where you failed. You cannot afford to remain in the place where you are broke down. Even if you lost the battle at some point, get to build the capacity, rise up from that place and fight again. Because you cannot afford to be the defeated person. You must fight to win. If you do not fight to win, there will always be a consequence of losing the battle. Any battle that you lose has consequence in your life. And that can be destructive. And that's why you cannot afford to lose any battle. And so today I want to talk to us about the fact that living is the process of raising. Living is the process of racing. Racing. In other words, life is a race. Life is a race, and there's never been a time when the human race became a people that are on a race like today. This is a generation that is actually on a race because life is racing. And I pray that God is going to help us to be able to see this deeply inside of your life. I pray that God helps you to understand that living is racing because the moment you see it, then you want to begin to understand the factors of racing. Now, this is the point because I know I'm going to talk about this at some point, but I, I need to bring it at a found, as a fundamental factor that as we read in the book of Ephesians chapter number 6, Paul, first of all, gets to confront us with the need of preparation. And so the apostle says in verse number 10, he says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So the apostle tells us that we must be strong. In other words, you can't afford to be the weak one. And then verse number 11, he goes on to say, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. And verse number 12, the apostle wants us and he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and dominions and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And then the apostle goes on in verse number 13. He said, therefore, put on the full armor of God. Look at the next word. So that when the day of evil comes, you may stand your ground and having done all to stand. The apostle says that there is a day of evil that it does not talk about if. It talks about when it comes. In other words, according to the apostle, the day of evil does come upon everybody. Every human being that lives in this life has a moment of the day of evil. And that is what Paul tells us about. And so when the day of evil comes, the apostle says that you may be able to stand your ground. You must be able to stand your ground. You must have equipped yourself with the weapons of God, with the armor of God. And so when the day of evil comes, he says, stand your ground and fight so that when you have fought, you have done everything, then you should remain standing. That is the principle. Now, I'm coming here to tell you 
that because living is the process of raising to a goal, the day of evil comes to hinder the race of your life. The day of evil comes. Every time that the day of evil comes, it is seeking to jeopardize the process of racing in your life. And that is what I wanted to get in your spirit. Because if you get it, then you will begin to understand that you are here for a time and you are never supposed to ever squander any moment. You want to make sure that you are never stopped or hindered by any force or any factor. Now, let's look at a couple of scriptures so that you can be able to understand what Paul, the apostle, is talking about in this portion of scripture. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 9, in verse number 11, the wise man Solomon, inspired by God Almighty, speaks this word. And he said, I've seen something else under the sun. The first line of that verse of scripture says, the race is not to the swift. Now, the wise man Solomon is not saying that, um, that, that, that it's not talking about the winning. It's talking about the fact that everybody, whether you are swift or you are slow, you will be challenged to race. In other words, living is racing, whether you are swift or you are not. Whether you have speed or you are slow, you will be challenged to race. That is what I wanted to get there. He said the race is not only to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. In other words, even the weak face the battle. The only thing is, when the time of racing comes, the swift will win. When the time of battle comes, the strong will win. That is the principle. The race is not only to the swift. All human race will always race. Everybody that is part of humanity will race. You are challenged to race. You are in a living process that is a racing process. And so you must know that you're in a race. It is not just the people that go for marathon and all of those kind of sprinter races. It is uh, living is racing. That is the thing that I wanted to get. And so I want to talk to us shortly about what I call the three principles that constitute racing. And I will I pray that God is going to help us. Let's look at another scripture portion in the Bible where God talks about raising. If you look at the book of First Corinthians chapter number 9, and verse number 24 to 25, Paul the apostle says this word. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? He says, run in such a way as to get the prize. In other words, racing is always a process towards a prize. But then what he wants you to see is that all of us race. Now, if you look at the verses before that, the apostle has been talking about his uh, commitment to the gospel. And he talks about how he has become weak, that to the weak I've become weak, that I may win some of them. He says that he has become all things to all men so that he might win some of them. So the apostle concludes in verse number 23 and he says that I've become all things for the sake of the gospel. In other words, the apostle has a cause that the propagation of the gospel, he has a cause to reach mankind. Every soul that God has assigned to his responsibility, he must reach before he dies. And that cause, therefore, is a race. And so verse number 24, he gets to crown it up by saying, don't you know, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run to win the prize? That only one person get the prize, but everybody runs so that they can get the prize. And he's basically talking about the race of life. If you look at Hebrews chapter number 12, but number one, the writer of Hebrews speaks this word. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every weight that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I want us to look at those scriptures because they're going to become basis 
of what we're going to talk about. Now, there are three factors that constitute a race. There are three factors that will compel the human living process and turn it into a racing process. I'm going to say that again. There are three, three factors that actually get to turn the human living process into a racing process. And the moment you understand that, it will help you. The moment you understand that you are in a race, then you begin to understand the factors that govern racing. And you want to make sure that you build the capacity to win the prize. Because if you don't win the prize, there will be a consequence. And that is what I want to show you in a short while. Now, the first factor that gets to turn the human living process into a racing process is the fact of timing. The fact of timing. I want you to understand that living is a timed process. Living in time. Living in this side of time is a timed process. Living on earth is a timed process. You're a human being. Because you've been given a soul and a body. In other words, in the spirit realm, you are a spirit. But when you're given a body and a soul, you become a human being. And you are transferred to the, the side of time to live here for a purpose. You come here on a mission. You come here for a purpose. Everybody comes here for a purpose. There is nothing that is created for nothing. There is no life that is given for nothing. So when you come to this, this side of eternity, when you come to live on earth as a human being, when you come to the domain of man, you come for a purpose. You come on a mission. Now because purpose is time dependent, you are given a time slot within which to fulfill purpose. A prayer that I can post there, you get. You are living here for a time. You are given a time slot. Specific time slot. Everybody has a specific time slot within which to live on earth. To fulfill purpose that is given a time span. That is why the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes 3. And verse number 1 to 2. He said, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. I wanted to see that there is a time for everything. In other words, the purpose for which you came is an activity. It is something that must be carried out in this life, in this time, and it has its own time. So now the wise man says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. The purpose you came for is an activity under heaven, and it's been given a season. It's been given a time slot. It's assigned a time. And that is the time within which you must live to fulfill it. Now, if you go on in the book of Acts chapter number, now the same, the same scripture portion, Ecclesiastes 3, but number 2. Let me not jump out of that. It says in verse number 2, it said there's a time to, live, to, to be born and a time to die. In other words, he's saying there is a time you are born, there's a time when you come, and there's a time when you die. And so you are given a time slot. That's the thing that I want you to see. You have a time slot. Why? Because your purpose is an activity that has been assigned a season. So in the book of Acts chapter number 17, then we find Paul speaking to a crowd that is gathered. And he says this word. He speaks about God, and he says, from one man, but number 26 to 27, from one man, God made every nation of men. And he determined the set time and the exact places where everyone must live. I want you to see that. That from one man, God made all nations of men. And God determined the time and the exact place where all shall live. In other words, the time that you came was preset by God. The time within which you must live has been preset by God. The place has been preset by God. And it's all for a purpose. So you came here within a certain time slot and to serve a certain purpose that has been given a time span. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully because this is the point. Every purpose has its own time span within which it is relevant. 
the moment the time span is over, the purpose loses its relevance. And so also does the purpose bearer. I want to say that again. The purpose you came for has a time span within which it must be fulfilled. Outside of this time span, that purpose loses its relevance, and the purpose carrier who's supposed to carry it out also loses relevance. That is the point that I wanted to get. That's why anything that keeps you from fulfilling your purpose within that time span, therefore causes a consequence in your life. Now, I, I, I want to I I show you something that I pray will help you to understand what I'm talking about in here. If you try to take your child to school when your child is 30, don't you realize something is wrong? You realize that you've already missed out on the time within which you needed to educate your child. That's what I'm talking about. If you look, for example, even in this world, and you look at the world of innovation, you will find that there are certain products that used to be marketable several years ago, but that have lost their relevance. Right now, the telephone that we use is put in the pocket. But I've got to tell you that several years ago, the founder, the innovator, the person that started, that offered the telephone, Graham Bale, was a man that never thought of the cell phone in the pocket. He just made a phone that could actually be found in one town. In fact, he actually spoke about the phone and he said the telephone is indeed a good innovation. I hope that one day every town will have one. That was actually Graham Bale. Now, this is the man who is actually the person who first thought the telephone and brought it into reality. And in those days, they had to be connected by physical wires and he's dreaming that one day every town will have one phone. Now, if Graham Bell lived today and is still manufacturing the same telephone that he made in his time, he would be irrelevant. Not because it's never been important. It is only now, it's outside of his lifespan. It's outside of his time span. It is outside of the time span within which his purpose makes sense. And so if he lives now and is making the same telephone that he made then, he would be irrelevant. In fact, I think he could probably just walk in the museum, telephone museum, to teach people how he started it all. That, that would be the only relevance because he can no longer sell the phone that he made. That's what I'm talking about. That your purpose has a time span within which it must be fulfilled. And outside of that time span, the purpose becomes irrelevant and you too becomes irrelevant. That's why when the time span of your purpose is over, then you actually become redundant and you retire or you become expired. That's how you find when the purpose time is over, you are over. That's why you find that humanity then dies. I want you to understand that death is supposed to be expiring. That you have been living your life in your time. And because your time is over, then your life expires. In fact, in the Bible, it is called falling asleep. You fall asleep because your night has come. It is called resting because now you are tired. Why? Because your time is over. So somebody else is strong, but you are tired. Why are you tired? Because the time within which you are supposed to fulfill your purpose is over. That is the principle that I wanted to see. So I wanted to get this. Every time that you do not live through to the finish line of the time slot that is given to you, there is a consequence. It is possible that you have not been able to fulfill the purpose for which you came. And that is why you must know that you must race. So every time that the day of evil comes, it comes so that it can jeopardize the race of your life and keep you from coming to the finish line. Have you ever watched a race and seen somebody that never made it to the finish line? Maybe someone tripped him in the course of it and he failed and he got injured and he never came to the finish line. There is always a consequence. No matter what capacity you had to get your goal, if you fail in the course of the journey and you never came to the finish line, there is no reward. 
There is no fulfillment. There is no achievement of the goal. That is the principle that I'm trying to make you understand, beloved. Dear viewer, I pray that you get it. Because if you get it, then you begin to understand the significance of making sure that you win every battle you are going through now. If you truly understand that the battle that has come against you is trying to keep you from coming to the finish line. If you truly understand that the battle has come to keep you from coming to the finish line, you want to do everything you can to fight to win. You cannot afford to lose this battle that you're going through. It could be marital battle. could be financial battle. It could be spiritual battle. could be battle against your body. Something is determined to make you fall and make you die before you come to the finish line. And there's going to be a consequence if you don't come to the finish line. And something is determined to make sure that you do not get to the finish line. I pray that you just allow yourself a little more determination that you pull yourself out together and you say, I am not going to give up. I pray that, that God, God is going to use that to minister to you and help you rise up until you win. You cannot afford to lose whatever battle that you're going through. Point number two that is so important about the race. We talk about the three factors that turn living into racing. And the factor number one is the timing. In other words, living is a timed process. And the fact of timing then turns living into racing. Number two, the goal. Now, you understand that living is the process of racing towards a goal. And indeed, all race races are actually towards a goal. In fact, all races are towards a medal, and the best of the medals is always called gold. And that really becomes the goal. Now, I want you to understand that every course of your life's journey, everything that you are here to do, everything that you're seeking to do, is actually has its own mark of achievement. There is a platform of achievement. There is a platform of success. There is a measure of achievement that will always determine whether you succeeded or not. But if you really don't nail it on that achievement standard or level, then you find you failed, no matter how much you actually try to do. I pray that I'm making sense to somebody. Uh, you, you must understand that living is always towards achieving a goal. It's always towards achieving a goal. And it is when you achieve that goal that you actually call successful. The moment you don't achieve the goal, you are a failure. You will have failed to actually fulfill the course of your living. In other words, there is a standard measure that you must attain for you to be called successful. And that is what we call achievement. And that is your goal. In all aspects of your life, you are actually raising towards gold. Now, anything that keeps you from getting to reach your goal will always make you settle for less. If you do not achieve your gold, you may have to settle for silver. Every time that you don't achieve your goal, you will eventually have to settle for something less. In other words, not being able to achieve your goal is consequential. And the consequence is negative upon your life. Hallelujah. So anything that comes to jeopardize the race of your life and that keeps you from getting to achieve your goal, keeps you from achieving your goal, and whatever keeps you from achieving your goal will cause negative consequence upon your life. Even if you're dealing with the spiritual, you have a spiritual life. That is what God calls spiritual success. For all of us that are in the kingdom of God, that is what God calls spiritual success. And there are factors that will do everything they can to make sure that your spiritual journey of life or your spiritual race is jeopardized. When you look in the scripture, for example, you actually get to understand that your spiritual life has purpose that it must fulfill. Your spiritual life is actually supposed to be the kind of spiritual capacity that you build. It's supposed to be a measure by which you relate to God. In other words, God gave you your spirit to help you relate to God. And so, the healthier your spirit is, the greater the capacity that you have spiritually 
will always get to enhance your relationship with God. But not only so, when your spiritual life has capacity, it helps you win spiritual battles. There are battles that are purely spiritual, that are not carnal, they are not physical. That's why the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Why? Because what you, the battles you fight are spiritual. But for you to win the spiritual battles, you must have a certain spiritual capacity. That is what spirituality is. So you need to build your spiritual life to a certain capacity. And when you reach that capacity, that is called success. You will have fulfilled your spiritual goal. When you get to establish the spirituality to a certain measure, you will find that even in your lineage, you've established spiritual life that your descendants are going to inherit. There are people that are coming from homes where somebody else established spirituality. And so getting saved is easy. Walking with Christ is easier. Getting filled with the Holy Spirit of God is easier. Getting to hear God and receiving the purpose from God is easy for them. Why? Because somebody else got to establish spirituality in that family lineage. And so the next generations don't have a problem because somebody established spiritual life. I pray that you get what I'm saying. And that is the goal of your life. You don't want to be a religious person. You don't want to be just a church goer. You want to be somebody that's built a spiritual capacity. You want to be somebody that carries the power of God. You want to be somebody that carries the anointing of God. You want to be somebody that's filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody that has the word of God. You want to be somebody that can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. You want to be somebody that is sensitive to the Holy Ghost. That can walk with the God. You want that to happen all of your life. So that your children grow up as they watch your spirituality. And that becomes something they can inherit even in their life. And they can be able to love the Lord because someone established spirituality or spiritual life in their lives. I pray that that makes sense to you. Now, any time that the day of evil comes, the enemy seeks to jeopardize this cause so that you never come to spiritual achievement. I can tell you, beloved, there are so many people even in the church who know the kind of spirituality they should come to, the kind of spiritual level they should get to. They know the call of God. They know what sort of person they should be. But then the battles of life have actually curtailed them. And so you are religious in church, and you know it. You know there's a higher height you can come to. But several times, things have battled you down and buffeted you until you've never been able to build that spiritual capacity. Because every time that the day of evil comes, it is seeking to, end, to make sure that you never come to the fulfillment of your life's goal. That is true spiritually. That is true in regards to marriage. What God calls marriage to success is not what your tribe calls marriage to success. What God calls marriage to success is when the two have become one. That is the goal that God has set for us. In the book of Genesis 2 and verse number 24, God said, For this reason, the man shall leave his, fa leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. And not until the two have become one does God call your marriage a success. And it's only then that you have established marriage that even will become heritage to the next generation. Many of us have struggled in marriage for so many years to establish marriage because nobody established marriage for you. You're coming from a background where your father was a polygamous person, coming from a background where marriages broke. Nobody dared to pay the price to establish marriage for you. And so because of that, therefore, you struggle to establish marriage. Because there's nothing left for you to inherit. When you get to win the marriage of battle and come to the place where the two have truly become one and you've established marriage, you're giving the next generation something to inherit from your own personal labor in this life. That is what God calls marital achievement. And when you look at your life financially too, there is financial achievement. When you look at your life in terms of health, there is achievement. There is a place where you live above the level of poverty. There is a place where you you establish wealth to a place where you have a capacity that nothing has the ability to break or shake. That is what we are talking about. 
And God wants you to build it. But every time that the day of evil comes, it always seeks to jeopardize your building process so that your, your goals are never attained. Have you ever met somebody that fell short of the goal? Some people even get depressed when they fall short of their goal because they were on a race and suddenly they found that they could not be able to finish their race. Or they finished but they never got the goal because something else took their goal. That is what we are talking about. God wants you to fight until you win because losing has negative consequence you cannot afford. Factor number three that makes living become a process of raising. Factor number three that's so important is this. It is the factor of competition. In other words, in every race, there is a competitor. Now, I want you to understand that there are positive competitions. In other words, there's positive competition. There's positive competition on every platform that actually enhances the standard of quality. There is this positive competition in the industrial market that makes the products get to attain higher quality as, as, as competition gets to, you know, kind of heightened. Then you find the producers, the manufacturers get to aim higher and they produce better standards of service, better quality in the product, and that is good for everybody. But there's also negative competition. There are factors that come against your life to compete against you for evil purpose. There are factors that will always try to keep you from coming to your goal. That is the reason for the competition. In fact, in this life I've discovered there are even people that are not going anywhere. All they want to do is to pull down everybody that's trying to go somewhere. That's why if you are this kind of person looking to everybody to support you and to cheer you up, i got to tell you, you can't make it. Because you must always be ready that there are people that will jeer you rather than cheer you. That's right. You must understand there are people that will never cheer you up. They will always jeer you. There are people that have no goal to go anywhere. They are cheer just to do everything they can to shoot down anybody trying to go somewhere. They will talk negatively. They will try to mock you up. They will criticize you. They will do everything they can. These are factors of competition, but they're negative factors of competition, and they're targeting you to make sure that you never come to the fulfillment of your goal. When you're dealing with competitors, you're dealing with forces that are trying to stop you from coming to the achievement of your goal. But there are also factors that don't just try to hinder you. They're actually targeting the same goal that you're going for. That's why in every race, you will always find that there is somebody that is looking at the same goal that you're going for. You're going for this gold, and it's only one gold. If you miss that one gold, you have to settle for silver. And if you miss the silver, you got to settle for bronze. And if you miss the bronze, it's possible you settle for no medal. You finish, but you didn't have any medal. And the reason is simply because someone overtook you and managed to pick what was supposed to be yours. And that is how this life is. There are factors that will always seek to compete against you to rest, to, to make sure that they take away the gold you're reaching out for. And that is why you can't afford to lose any battle because when the day of evil comes, what the enemy seeks to do is to make sure that it overtakes you and make sure that it takes the gold you're reaching out for. There are two scriptures of interest to me. If you look at the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 28, God warned the Israelites in verse number 15 onwards. He said, but if you live in disobedience, then God spoke to them and said, this curses will pursue you and overtake you. Now, whether you believe in curses or you don't, I'm just reading a scripture for you. God talks about the fact that curses pursue and overtake. You're talking about dealing with something that is racing up against you. In other words, you are in a race. You're reaching out for a goal. You are seeking to come to spiritual success. You're seeking to come to financial success, marital success. You're seeking to come to the success of your health. And you're seeking to build something to the place of success. You are coming to your goal. But then there is something that is pursuing you with the intent of overtaking you. 
And for people that understand the factors of curses, curses can actually get to pursue you and eventually overtake you. So you find the things that you could get with ease in the olden days, now you can no longer access because something has overtaken you and doing everything it can to hinder you. Now, I'm not here to talk about curses and blessings at this moment. I'm just giving you a scripture that God talked about. There are forces that compete against you and they seek to overtake you, to block you, so that eventually you don't come to the place where you realize the goal that you're reaching out for in the race of life. The book of Hebrews 12 that we've just read in verse number one, God speaks this word, says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every weight that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So I want you to see the order. It's saying that we are running with perseverance the race. There is a race. So we are actually in the race of life. But then he says that you must first of all throw away every weight that hinders. I want you to see the apostle is inspired by God to write to the church. Not people that are of this world. He's writing to the church and he's telling the people of the church that it is possible in the race of this life that you have weights that hinder. There are things that can come upon your life and they're weighing you down to reduce your speed so that now you are slowed down. So by the time that you reach the mark, you find your gold has gone. That is something that many people have struggled with over life. Now, if I had the time, I would have talked to you about the fact that today, when you're actually journeying in the course of your spiritual life, that is reaching, you're reaching out for your spiritual goal, today the dynamics of life have changed. And so getting to attain the spiritual mark is harder today than it was ever the years before. Today, you're living at a time when the spiritual settings have changed. Today, you're living at a time where even satanism has legal, uh, legal license to function in society because of democracy. You're living at a time when magicians have the ability to actually have a television program, global television program. You're living in a time where you can actually have a witch on international television administering to, its, to his own clients before everybody. You're living in a time when the mediums are exalted on international media and they're actually calling the dead relatives of clients and they're actually experiencing spiritual presence of the dead in their offices before the glare of the camera. You're living at a time when the spiritual factors, dynamics have changed. And so getting to build spiritual stature and coming to achieve your spiritual goal is harder because of the competing factors that are trying to hinder your spirituality. I pray that that makes sense to you. It's not like the days of Paul. The days of Paul, they faced a lot more of physical resistance and persecution. But today, you are living at a time when even the atheists will actually want to preach on the television and tell humanity there's no God. And so when you've listened to that or when your children have listened to all of this jargon going on on the television, then they come to church and you're trying to preach the word of God. It doesn't make sense. Why? Because there are things that are competing against you to make sure that you can't establish your spirituality. And that is true concerning marriage. The factors against marriage are stronger and more than it's ever been before. The factors against your health are more than the, it's ever been before. So I'm ministering to you right now. A new virus is being combated by the people of the world. Everybody's struggling against corona right now. Everybody's rising up to fight corona. It's a new virus that's come to fight the body of man. And so you will find that where you had the capacity through your immunity to be able to live longer, to live healthy for longer. Now your immune system has to actually cost you more to build because there's another virus that is coming up against you. That is what we are talking about. If you look at the financial marketplace today, there are more forces of poverty than has ever been before. And that is true with every aspect of your life. There are forces that have come to compete against you to keep you from reaching your gold, your gold. And so every time that the day of evil comes, the intent is to actually slow you down and make sure that you don't access your gold. And that's why you can't afford 
to lose any battle that you face in this life. So in Ephesians 6, verse number 13, Paul says, Therefore, therefore put on the full armor, armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, when you realize that what you're going through is actually not innocent, this is not human, this is not something that has to do with human factors. This is spiritual. This is the day of evil. I'm fighting something that is coming for my destruction. When you realize this is none other than satanic force that is coming against you, you know you cannot afford to lose the battle. Because if you lose it, there's a consequence. Your gold will be taken. And you will come to the place where you have not reached the achievement level that you are supposed to achieve. I pray that that gets you to a place where you want to awaken and make sure that all battles in your life are won. Are you fighting to win or are you fighting for the sake of it? Are you the kind of person that is going through something right now that you're about to give up? I came to tell you, giving up is not an option. Giving up is actually suicidal. It is not an option. You only give up when now you are willing to let this force of evil sweep you to the land of destruction. That's why you can't afford to give up. And I pray that you will get up out of, on your feet and get to fight again for the glory of God. Because God says you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And indeed you are. If you're willing to engage your will and engage and stand on the word of God that says you are more than a conqueror, God is going to invest in you every instrument that is required for you to win. But God is looking for your will. God is looking for your stunt if God is going to walk with you. I pray that God helps you to see it. I want to come to the close of the service and I want us to pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I lift every body out there that is going through any moment of life, any dark hour, any hour of, of, of battle that they're facing in their lives, anybody right now that is experiencing the day of evil. It could be spiritual, it could be marital, it could be financial, it could be upon their body. Lord, you have never failed to heal anybody that truly trusts in you. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you may stretch your hand of grace upon everybody listening to me. And that you may empower your people to arise from the place of their slumber. That you may cause somebody to come up and stand in the name of Jesus Christ. May you encourage the discouraged. May you give hope to the hopeless. May you give strength to the weak. May you grant somebody that has just lost a battle to rise up again, my father, until they win the battle of life for the glory of your name. I pray for your blessing upon every life. I pray for your strength. I pray for your hope to come upon them. I pray, Father, that the Spirit of God comes upon everybody listening right now and causes resurrection in Jesus' mighty name. And if you're watching there, I'm sure you say to me and wherever you are. I want to pray with you who want to give. And I want to thank all of you who support this program and who support this altar and our ministry. May the Lord our God bless you. We thank God for all of your contributions, those of you who send of your tithe and your offerings. May God bless you greatly. I'm praying for you personally and I pray that God is going to help you. He's going to raise your businesses, bring you to another level and that God is going to bless you greatly. God is a God of surprise. He says to the faithful, he will show himself faithful. May he show himself faithful to you even in this season for the glory of his name. But I want to pray for you. You want to give of your tithe. You want to send of your blessings of any kind. I want to pray that God may get to open up the heavens over you. Father, I pray over the giver in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, you've said that you give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. I pray, Father, that you may cause your heavens to be open over the lives of your people. Let your blessing pour upon the lives of your people beyond measure. I release it as a priest over the lives of your people over their businesses, over their work, everything, my God. I pray whatever they touch will prosper. In Jesus' mighty name. I never like to close this live feed without getting to give you an opportunity. If you're out there, you've never given your life to Christ, or you gave your life to Christ and you fell back, and you really desire to come back to the Lord today, I want to lead you in prayer. And I pray that God helps you to commit your heart in the course of this prayer because it's going to make a difference. God's going to reach out to you right now, even through this prayer that we're going to make together. Just say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I acknowledge 
that I'm a sinner. And I acknowledge that you are the